Good evening. Um, Multi-slide CT scan and IVUS, perfect combination for screening symptomatic vulnerable patient. The title is not from uh, coming from me, but uh, I think more took care of this uh, title. But I always accepted the challenging title. Um, I think there is a new diagnostic world of the vulnerable plaque. And I think there is new entries in the diagnostic process. Basically on this slide, there is three colleagues of myself in the thorax center. The number one is a middle-aged cardiologist who got chest pain for 20 minutes in the airplane coming back from the United States. He didn't do anything, he didn't tell anybody, and the next day, the only thing he did was jogging uh, in the cold air in Rotterdam to prove himself that he has nothing. He didn't feel nothing, and that's at the end of the story. The second is a well-known individual. He has made his uh, multi-slide CT scan public domain, that's a PIM defect. He's showing his multi-slide CT scan. There is clearly a soft plaque in the proximal LED. There is nodules of calcium pinging a diagonal, and he's living with these pictures of multi-slide CT scan. The third person is a female, which is in this, the highest uh, sex style of CRP, and uh, she doesn't know what to do about it. Now, if the same individual at all three at the same time, maybe, maybe, that's the question for today, we should have, we should go to some kind of invasive assessment of the so-called non-flow limiting lesion. The trouble is, one you got in the non-invasive imaging, with all the gadgetry that we have, you will be confronted with such pictures, such compelling evidence, that at some point you will feel obliged to do something about it. And that's what I want to discuss with you today. We have started a study and finished a study called IBIS. IBIS stands for Integrated Biomarker and Imaging Study. On one hand, we are looking at the expanding the role of biomarkers in predicting plaque instability. And on the other hand, we are detecting and characterizing iris coronary lesion with different imaging techniques, multi-slide CT scan, QCA, quantitative IVUS, echogenicity, virtual histology, and palpography. Now, for the uh, markers, we are looking at the C-reactive protein, the interleukin-6, the tumor necrosis factor A, and the monocyte chemotractin protein MCP1. As plaque instability markers, we are looking at the matrix metalloproteinase 9 and the pregnancy-associated plasma protein PAP-A. For as a novel markers, we are looking at the lipoprotein-associated phospholipase A2 activity, and at the soluble CD40. And finally, we are looking at the oxidative stress marker, the myeloperoxidase MPO. Now, we have collected so 85 patients. They are not asymptomatic patients. They had, at some point in their life, some chest pain, some have stable angina, silent ischemia, or even acute coronary syndrome, and you see the patient with acute MI, troponin positive and troponin negative. And the first step is to do indeed a multi-slide CT scan. And you see that today your multi-slide CT scan uh, depicts quite nicely what you could see with a conventional coronary angiography. So the first step is the biomarkers. And it's amazing to see that in this population with stable, unstable, and acute myocardial infarction, we see this is a logarithmic scale, mind. We see tremendous significant difference between the stable, the unstable, and the acute myocardial infarction for 
high sensitivity CRP and for the interleukin. The other parameters does not show too many difference except the metalloproteinase, which is significantly higher in patients with acute myocardial infarction. Now, I must tell you that I've been shocked by what we call the proteomic revolution. Basically, in these 85 patients that I have shown you, all of them have all these parameters, and we are working with cluster test statistics to see what it means. But that's feasible today. Now, the patient I show you, the corneal angiogram and the multi-slide CT scan, has this profile, which is very difficult to explain. Everything is within the range except the metalloproteinase 9, which is clearly outside the range. The next step is to do the multi-slide CT scan and the corneal angiogram. I've shown you these pictures. You see the resolution of the multi-slide CT scan. You have this nucleus of calcium. You have certainly some soft material in the vessel wall of this uh, patient. And if you do the corneal angiogram, you will find a lesion of clearly less than 50%. In this particular case, 38%. But if we do the statistic of the 85 individuals that we have studied, basically the diameter stenosis on average was 26%. We are clearly addressing lesions which are non-flow limiting. Now the next step is uh, IVUS with tissue echogenicity. That's the region of interest. And that's basically what we saw in these patients. And as you see, there's a lot of material in the wall. And clearly there is a reduction of more than 50% in the um, EEM in the external elastic membrane, and on systole and diastole you can appreciate uh, the motion of this plaque. Now if this is the proximal part, this appearance is quite disturbing. And as a matter of fact, if you look in more detail to this place, you start to visualize two layers which are apparently separated and which are highly uh, significant, suggesting some uh, early degree of state of stage of plaque rupture. Now, when you do the IVUS of this region of interest in these uh, 85 patients, you realize that they, on average, have a reduction of the external elastic membrane area of more than 50 percent. And as you could see, the region of interest, the short segment that we have analyzed has a length of 33 millimeter. And you realize that in this short segment of 33 millimeter, you can have one, two, three, four, or five plaque has been emphasized by a previous speaker. Now, here is the attempt to correlate the IVUS with the multi-slide CT scan. We are in the process of quantifying that. It's a hard work for bioengineering group. But so far, we define as small, less than one millimeter, medium one to two, large more than, more than two. And you can define the Arnsfeld unit in these uh, plaque, which correlate to the uh, IVUS. And if you look at this population, we had a certain number of small, medium, and large plaque with or without uh, calcium, and you could see in the mean value, the mean ounce field value. Now, in the correlation with the IVUS, which is a, a novelty, what we do is we take the brightness of the adventitia, we made the Gaussian distribution of this brightness, and the median is what serves as a reference to define the echogenicity of the lesion itself. In other words, in this plaque, which is on the left-hand side of the median for the brightness of the adventitia is hypoechogene. What is on the right-hand side is hyperechogene. And you can identify it very easily a small nucleus of calcium. And you can quantify that in volume. Now, just this slide to show you that we go and go in great detail 
define the arc and the length of the arc of these uh, small piece of calcium with IFUS. But the interesting point before going back to the multi-slide CT scan is then when you look at these biological marker, at least two of them were in some way, and I recognize that the Pearson coefficient of, uh, correlation of 0.31 is weak, but at least it is correlated with the CRP and with the interleukin-6. In other words, hypoechogenicity is in some way statistically related with these parameters. Now, to come back to the work that was done on uh, IVUS and multi-slide CT scan, this is the angiography, this is the multi-slide CT scan. You see here in the AV groove between the right atrium and the right ventricle, this cross-section, you can zoom and clearly to see the lumen and the calcium in the plaque. And that's how it looks on IVUS. You can take another region where there is no calcium, basically. Again, zoom, and you will see only the lumen opacified by the contrast without calcified plaque. And a little bit further, this is the IVUS. We'll find another uh, site with the lumen and the calcium. And again, on IVUS, you will find these calcium and quantified. Now, this slide is very important. And I guess this slide at some point will be in the literature because it is the very first attempt to correlate IVUS in terms of reduction of the EM by more than 50% and taking into account the calcium with what we have seen, if we have seen on the multi-slide CT scan, a plaque or not, and that's on slide thickness of 5 millimeters. And I would like to draw your attention that for the first time we, we talk about a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 73%. We are not talking about sensitivity and specificity of the multi style CT scan to detect a narrowing of more than 50%. We are talking now about something which is below 50%, between maybe 20 and 50%. It is a novelty. Now, of course, we have done that on a small region of interest, something which was about 30 millimeter of length, and it doesn't have any value because we are interested, like Valentin has said, by the total coronary plaque burden. So this work has been done to look at the whole coronary burden. And basically, what you see in orange, in red, and in yellow, in red, it is when you have 95% in the segment 6 of the EHA, we have detect some plaques. So the proximal LED is very prone to show a plaque. 32% is a large plaque. In the mid LED, in 80% of the case, we saw plaque. In 40%, we saw large plaque. The orange is below 75. You see basically the whole right. A great deal of the circumflex and the diagonal has also plaque. And you could see the percentage for large plaque, 12, 20, 14, 22, 28. By the way, the main stem show plaque in 51% of the case and in 9% of the case for severe plaque. So basically, the potential killer is in the proximal LED. And only a few segments uh, show plaque below uh, 50%. So we try to do a, a total plaque burden score. It's purely arbitrary. Number of plaque, which is small, medium, and large. And we went to a total score globally of 15.5, non-calcified 4.2, mixed 5.6, and calcified 5.8. And then we went back to our biomarkers. And as you could see, we were surprised and not surprised to see that there is maybe statistically, and it is remarkable, some relationship with the suitable uh, CD40 and with the MCP1. Palpography is uh, something that we have in our institution. All these patients have had palpography. In one word, it is the backscattering of the radiofrequency signal at two levels of blood pressure. 
Uh, what you see in blue here is something which is hard, stiff, and rigid in front of the plaque. What is yellow is soft, deformable, fragile, breakable. And you see here at the inch between the plaque and the normal tissue some change in color uh, showing clearly that this region is deformed by the stress of the blood pressure. Now that is how it looks in uh, the reality when we do a pullback what is uh, stable rigid is seen in blue and when we came to a region which is of high strain like here then you have this color yellow indicating uh, deformation of more than 2%. And we have created a classification and obviously it is bad news to have a rock 4. We know it's a French cheese, it doesn't smell very good, <laughs> but it's bad news and it is to have a rock 4. And to come back to our patient and you recognize the coronary artery, you see that this individual has a lot many plays with ROC4. And it is clear that in this population of 85 uh, patients, uh, the stable at on average 1.5 ROC4, the unstable 1.9, and acute myocardial infarction 245. What is also interesting is that in the uh, search for correlation with the biomarker, we saw that LPPLA2 was in some way correlate with the palpography parameters. I think I will skip the angus. This is something that we are doing in our patient by combining IVUS and uh, echocardiography. But I can tell you that we are able to correlate eye strain with high and short C stress, but I'll skip this part. Virtual histology. We don't know what to do with that. It's a brand new technique which has been established by uh, Cleveland. It is also using the radio frequency signal for tissue characterization. I will not tell you in detail, but clearly there is an attempt to use the IVUS information, the histology, and color code the cross-sectional of the IVUS in color corresponding to calcium, lipid core, fibrolipidic and fibrous. There is very high expectation for these things. I think we have to be very, very critical, but certainly a lot of us are working currently on that issue. And to come back to all patients again, it is amazing that in the middle of the lesion we saw this red lipidic uh, necrotic core with a lipid bit of calcium. And it is tempting, at least we have done that with uh, Jim Willison, to try to correlate more or less the library of virtual histology with the whole scheme of uh, progression of coronary artery disease. And you can potentially qualify, uh, qualify the calcium volume, the fibrous volume, the fibrolipidic volume, but at, at that stage we don't know if you will tell us something about the vulnerability of the patient. Thermographic is a very specific but uh, non-sensitive tool. Uh, it has a hard time right now because it's very rare to find a place with temperature, with uh, an increase of temperature of uh, more than uh, 0.09 degrees Celsius. And the optical coherence tomography is a superb uh, tool but is not uh, available right now for clinical use. At least is that the instrument that we have been using for the last uh, 18 months, which is a, a very small instrument, this uh, fiber has 140 micron, the catheter is one millimeter, and the resolution of the uh, optical coherence tomography is very high. And we all know these uh, uh, pictures which has been uh, collected by uh, Renu Vermani, showing basically uh, a vessel which is normal without any luminal encroachment. But if you look carefully in the vessel wall, you see many areas suggesting uh, lipid necrotic material separate from the lumen by a very a thin uh, cap. And again, to come back to the patient that I show you,
This is uh, the patient that we have seen, and I'll let these things going in loop because there is two pieces of information which is quite amazing. The first one is that at some point you see something very thin here. You see some layer there which might be the media, but going back and back you find regularly this thin, and I would say, cap. The second thing which is amazing is there is a small vessel of less than uh, 50 micron which is joining the lumen uh, just at the edge of these uh, crescents. We don't know the interpretation of that but I would not be surprised that echo contrast would penetrate the vessel wall at that side and illuminate the vessel wall. And we have interpreted as, as uh, potentially a, fi a fibrance cap and we can try to correlate that with the uh, ivus, and you see clearly here uh, the wobbling motion of, uh, at the edge of this uh, cap. And that reminds me very much the histology of uh, Renu Vermani. So, tonight I told you many things which are disturbing, which is basically work in progress, it is for me very difficult to make any conclusion. On one hand, clearly we are making the bridge between the non-invasive imaging, the total burden, and some uh, marker, biological markers. Certainly, if an individual has chest pain, a lot of biomarkers and disturbing pictures on non-invasive imaging, you may be tempted to go further for uh, an invasive approach. There is no evidence-based medicine for that. It's purely a preliminary, a kind of pilot approach. Uh, the next step is that, like in this individual, when you get confronted with clinical syndrome, with a very high level of metalloproteinase, with many places where he has at that site an EM reduced by 50%, that you succeed in capturing these disturbing pictures of maybe a fibrous cap, that the virtual histology, the palpogram, and eventually the temperature confirm that you have something, it became very resistant, very difficult uh, to resist to the treatment. And to be honest, in uh, this individual with this lesion, we treated this lesion at that time, after consultation of many people in the audience, including uh, Renu Virmani. Now what happens in these individuals six months later, uh, that's the angiography six months later. If you look uh, at the IVUS, because we use a drug eluting stand, basically nothing has grown inside the stand. Although, I will tell you, if you do uh, an OCT, you will see that there is a little bit neoentomal hyperplasia in front of the strut, but this is very acceptable. The good news is that, um, this is the virtual histology, the good news is that if you repeat now your palpogram in this individual, all these red spots suspect to be region of high strain basically has disappeared because you have scaffold the vessel with the device. So there is probably some kind of uh, uh, device approach for this type of plaque. And finally, if you repeat the uh, shear stress analysis before stenting and after stenting, as you could see, all these regions, these alternance of high shear stress and low shear stress basically has disappeared because you have again scaffold the vessel. I have no conclusion tonight, but it's clear that uh, uh, we are making progress in the assessment of what we believe uh, to be an unstable plaque of a vulnerable plaque of something which is uh, on the, the verge of get ruptures. And uh, we try to develop some kind of uh, algorithm of treatment once you are so far in the game that you are confronted with the compelling evidence or all these technology. Thank you. <laughs>